All right. So I'm now joined by David Broder. He is, of course, Jacobin's Europe editor. He's also the author of the book, First They Took Rome, How the Populist Right Conquered Italy. And actually, he has an upcoming book from Pluto Press titled Mussolini's Grandchildren, Fascism in Contemporary Italy. I feel compelled to mention that you can actually pre-order this book from Pluto Press. And actually, if you order it from their website and use the code BROTER20, you can get 20% off. So I will link that down below. Uh, David, first of all, it's very exciting for us to be able to like share a code on this channel because we've never done that before. <laughs> Obviously, having no corporate sponsorships or anything of the like. Uh, but more importantly, great to see you. Hi, Jen. Great to see you too. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, so obviously you are here to talk about the recent election in Italy and uh, the results. You've been covering uh, the Italian right, obviously, for quite some time. Uh, I think people know that the big news over the weekend is that Giorgia Maloney and her far right party, the Brothers of Italy, uh, won an election in Italy and Maloney is now going to become the next prime minister. So obviously this is in the context of quite a lot of far right electoral activity in Europe more broadly lately. Uh, and and so, so it's a little difficult sometimes to kind of keep the different far right agendas straight. And obviously there is quite a bit of overlap between, you know, all of the different far right Right parties across Europe. But I guess the opening question for you is, uh, what exactly were the Brothers of Italy campaigning on? What does their platform look like? And a follow-up is, uh, what does their electoral base look like? Okay, so Brothers of Italy, Fratelli d'Italia, uh, is part of a right-wing coalition, which also includes two other parties, Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia and the anti-immigrant Lega, led by Matteo Salvini. Uh, these other two parties were in a cross-party coalition led by Mario Draghi, a uh, former chief of the European Central Bank uh, for the last year and a half, uh, alongside the centre-left Democrats and Five Star. Um, so basically, this election is the product of the downfall of that previous sort of national unity government, so-called. Uh, and when Draghi was uh, the prime minister... Uh, very much kind of fated by the centre-left as a kind of saviour of Italy, as someone bringing in European recovery uh, funds after the pandemic and so on. Uh, Meloni's party, Brothers of Italy, was the only opposition. Um, and basically, this election uh, allowed it to assert itself basically main, as the main party of the right-wing coalition, saying, you know, they hadn't been in coalition before, they're not to blame for what previous governments have been doing. Uh, but at the same time, kind of trying to assert themselves as not an overly destabilizing force, uh, particularly in terms of the European recovery funds uh, and in terms of foreign policy, Russia and Ukraine, uh, Italy's relation to the EU and so on. In fact, because uh, in a, even in advance of the election, when it was called in July, uh, it was basically guaranteed all along that the right wing coalition were, were bound to win and that Fratelli d'Italia were going to be the largest party. Uh, so actually the, the campaign mainly took the form of um, other parties sort of questioning whether Fratelli d'Italia were going to be disruptive, uh, whether they included sort of neo-fascist figures, uh, whether they were soft on Putin, this kind of thing. Uh, and then in response to that, Fratelli d'Italia claiming that they were being unfairly victimised and that the left uh, ought to apologise for their own uh, errors and crimes and their own undemocratic uh, conduct and so on. Uh, so, so the actual policy content of the campaign was very uh, thin, uh, including with regard to issues like energy bills, mm. uh, which, in fact, most Italians said was their uh, main, uh, you know, the thing that most concerns them. Uh, broadly, Fratelli d'Italia is a party uh, that um, uh, you know, centres its message on a very harsh uh, nationalist identity politics, the defence of the natural family. Um, at times in the past, that has, even in the recent past, uh, that's involved things like uh, great replacement theory, claiming that the left plans an ethnic substitution of whites in alliance with speculators like George Soros and this kind of thing. Um, but in this campaign, it, it basically mixed some of that kind of identity politics with the message that actually on the economy and on foreign policy, 
it won't be too uh, disruptive uh, in terms of who votes for them. Basically, um, I think it's it's kind of too easy to sort of assume that well, you know, they're this like rebellious force, so therefore they're like mobilizing, you know, disgruntled, left behind, uh, you know. Ex- working class voters, this kind of thing. Uh, but really, actually, if you look at the, the electorate and the overall right wing vote, you know, where the votes have come from, it's quite clear that basically what's happened is that Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, uh, now ha- has basically won votes from its own allies. The overall right wing vote is basically the same as it was in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, you know, kind of mid 40s percent. So in that right. sense, there's not really an expansion of the electorate. Uh, there are, of course, certain changes which have happened as Fratelli d'Italia has become a bigger party. I mean, in 2018, it only got 4%. So it was very, then had a very like identitarian electorate that probably previously belonged to other sort of neo-fascist uh, parties. Whereas this time, it had a lot more things like uh, you know holding a conference where it sort of showed off its business credentials, uh, including a few other kind of former Berlusconi ministers and that kind of thing, in order to sort of project the image of a sort of broader right wing party, but within which the the sort of old uh, neo fascist tradition is still is still somehow part. So that brings up something interesting, which is, uh, you know, in your articles, part of what you have argued is that uh, this this rise was on one hand kind of a long time in the making, and that the center right, uh, you know supposedly more moderate or supposedly, you know, parties that were supposed to be like a moderating force actually enabled and helped accelerate the rise of the far right. Uh, so how exactly has, has this played out over the last couple of years? Well, um, as I said, there's this coalition of these uh, three right wing parties. And, you know, the first time they went to government together was already in 1994. Uh, Berla- Silvio Berlusconi, the, you know, the billionaire tycoon, often, you know, compared to Trump and so on. Uh, he, he kind of gave us he gave a speech in 2019, where he said, well, you know, in the 1990s, I brought the fascists into government, he actually used the word fascists. Mm. Um, you know, I constitutionalized and legitimized them, I sort of brought them into the tent. Um, but over time, uh, he, you know, while he had a dominant position uh, in the right wing coalition in the in the nineties and two thousands, uh, that's kind of ebbed, uh, particularly in the uh, post two thousand eight crisis period. Uh, partly uh, because Berlusconi has often gone into a sort of um, broad tent or, or technocratic governments, which has sort of undermined his hold on the right. Uh, and and then in terms of push voters towards the further right uh, options, you know we saw uh, Matteo Salvini's Lega even before this was took over the leadership of the right wing from Berlusconi. Um, but then also, I mean, I think there's a strange kind of re- re- uh, reinvention of Berlusconi in recent years as a kind of cuddlier and more moderate uh, figure, which is rather strange for anyone who remembers the 2000s. Uh, it bears obvious comparison with the um, the way in which George W. Bush, uh, how his legacy has been sort of reinterpreted by parts of the U.S. Uh, sort of centrist and center right uh, in in the wake of Trump, in the mm-hmm. sense that a figure who was previously seen as as uh, extreme and and as, and as uh, pushing uh, away from the the more the imagined more moderate traditions of his party, uh, then in turn becomes the 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 golden age who was longed for. Um, but yeah, I mean, Berlusconi's government's played an important role in questioning the kind of anti-fascist identity of the Italian Republic, uh, in focusing policy on on harsh attacks on immigrants, uh, and in uh, electing for, or appointing former uh, fascists to ministerial roles. It should also be said, though, that, that this isn't only a process from coming within the right-wing coalition. And over time, we've seen uh, centre-left media and centre-left politicians also um, go in for this in adopting a, a quite indulgent uh, a view of uh, Milani, uh, including a notable uh, kind of amnesia uh, over over even quite recent uh, statements, which clearly point to her connection to, the, to a specifically neo-fascist uh, tradition. Mm-hmm. 
So, uh, you know, I think that actually raises another question, which is uh, we know that turnout in this election was incredibly, incredibly low. Uh, why was why couldn't either moderates or the left mobilize their bases in this election against the uh, ascendance of the far right? So part of the reason why the right won a majority of seats, even with uh, 44% of the vote, is an electoral system that rewards coalitions. Mm. So on the right, there was a united uh, three, uh, in fact, four party front, uh, whereas the various opposition forces, most importantly, the, the Democrats, who are the sort of uh, historic kind of liberal Europeanist party, uh, and then Five Star, which is a quite newer and more eclectic force, uh, they didn't make an agreement to run together. Uh, and then there were also various kind of smaller forces, both more centrist and uh, on, on sort of further left as well. Um, so I think that the, the problem is, is that the, the Democrats, who are the most important party, which are called center left, uh, in fact, I think you could say the more a better definition would be to call them a kind of uh, progressive neoliberal party, uh, which combines basically liberal uh, economics with um, some. Um, with, with embrace of the European Union, some civil rights stances and so on. Um, they ran their election campaign basically as trying to mobilise voters' um, uh, fear of the uh, danger, or maybe even just, in, uh, as they would put it, incompetence of the right-wing parties. Uh, so in that sense, they did try and rally uh, what could be called a loosely uh, an anti-fascist uh, vote. Uh, but at the same time, they didn't make the electoral coalition, which could have made the election even remotely competitive. So because there was simply no chance that the divided centre and centre-left would win, uh, the, the whole idea of the, the kind of useful, pragmatic vote uh, basically mobilised very few. Uh, the Five Star Movement uh, did a quite different kind of campaign, which was very focused on its uh, economic record in government. And even though it had a quite strange path when it was in government, because it was in coalition at different points with the Lega, so far right, uh, and at a different point with the Democrats uh, over the last few years uh, before joining Draghi's National Unity Government, uh, they very much played up a more kind of social image, so particularly uh, unemployment benefits, which they introduced in 2019 for the first time, uh, and also a nine euro an hour minimum wage. And Italy currently has no minimum wage. So from a very poor initial polling position of about eight or nine percent, uh, Five Star eventually got 15. Uh, so although that wasn't a great result for them, it showed a certain ability to mobilise basically southern working class voters. Uh, overall, I think beyond the sort of specific tactics of the election, what we see is indeed a massive uh, abandonment of electoral engagement by working class and southern voters, most of whom do not vote. And the overall turnout was 64%. Uh, that mightn't sound that bad uh, in the US context, right. if you think of but, but actually, Italy uh, in the 70s and 80s had, you know, 92, 93, 94 percent mm. turnout in elections. You know, it used to have big mass parties, uh, particularly a communist party, very rooted in in working class life and communities. And so the left, well, what passes for the left now is something very different to that, uh, because, uh, I mean, w one kind of indicative thing, I think, is there's, there was a kind of a satirical program which did like a fake ad for each advert for each of the parties. And the one they did for the Democrats was like an advert to not vote. And the idea was basically like the less people vote, the better the Democrats will do. Because as everyone uh, well, in Italy is known, uh, the, the Democrats are the party of older and wealthier Italians. Like the, the, le the, the more your income, the more likely you are to vote for them. And they also have a very old electorate. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, there's obviously after the election, there's been a lot of sort of discussion on the centre left, like should they have run together with Five Star and this kind of thing? Or, you know, should they even have run with kind of even more hawkish neoliberal centrists who also had a separate campaign? But, I mean, really the issue isn't that they didn't, you know, band together the votes they had. It's that, you know, m millions of votes, like, I mean, 
uh, to put it in very schematic terms, you know, the Democrat Party got five million votes. Mm -hmm. In 2006, the same, the, the coalition of the same forces got 19 million votes. So there's just been an, a very drastic uh, drop off in its uh, social base. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do want to ask you about uh, Maloney herself, uh, because, you know, there's obviously been a lot of media coverage around her. Uh, lots of people have sort of described her as like a new female Mussolini. Uh, and, and as you pointed out, uh, Italy has sort of had a kind of long history of various populist strongmen kind of rising to power. Uh, you, of course, had mentioned Berlusconi. So the question, I guess, is, is Maloney kind of a continuation of Mussolini or Berlusconi or or is she just complete, something completely different? Well, uh, here I am again tempted to plug my book and the title <laughs> Mussolini's Grandchildren, because I think it, the important thing is that there is a genealogy, there is a continuation, but it's also different. Yeah. Um, often when we think of, you know, often when we talk about, you know, is, you know, Marine Le Pen or, or Trump or maybe Bolsonaro, these other examples, we ask if they're fascist, and, and often the, the, the debate gets kind of ground down in the question of whether or not we think that it's important that they reflect the kind of political forms that were typical of the interwar period. You know, the social violence, uh, the veterans, uh, the, the sort of rising revolutionary movements, this kind of thing. But I think what's very interesting about the uh, case of Milani and Brothers of Italy is that there's actually a direct organisational continuity from the end of World War II to now. Uh, her party even has in its logo, and she explicitly defends the tradition of the uh, MSI, which was the party created by uh, the defeated uh, supporters of Mussolini in 1946. Uh, in fact, it was only made up of uh, the cadres who had followed Mussolini right to the end of the war uh, in the uh, fight alongside Nazi Germany against the partisans. Uh, so that was a very, um, very for a very long time, a, a, uh, a party in, in post-war democracy that kind of struggled to uh, sort of force itself into um, sort of real sort of national, you know, the, the area of parties that could be in government and was very much like a party of, of veterans uh, who sort of longed for the what they saw as the better days when they had their regime. Um, but then, so, so over time, though, there were kind of important changes, particularly in the sense that um, while, say, in the 1960s and 70s, uh, was a very violent period in Italian politics, and of course, you know, into the 80s, uh, the, the leaders of the 1940s were still around and still in charge of the party. Um, now that generation has passed, uh, the Cold War is over, there's no longer a mass Communist Party. Uh, so Milani joined the MSI in 1992, and that was also you know, pretty much the period when it was first uh, going into national government. Berlusconi, in his first uh, coalition in 1994, he included the MSI. Uh, they kind of made some sort of symbolic moves away from the, 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 the tradition of the regime, uh, in particular uh, by condemning its anti-Semitism, uh, the racial laws, the Holocaust. Um, and indeed, the parties ultimately merged. MSI directly, uh, which became Alianza Nazionale, uh, renamed itself, then it directly joined Berlusconi's party. But then the problem with that sort of progression, the, the sort of image of, of, sort of moderation, is that Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, was actually created in 2012 uh, as, a, as a split and as a partial rejection of, of, of that merger um, which actually like reclaimed the tradition of post-war neo-fascism. Um, so in Maloney's party, um, they openly venerate the leaders of the post-war MSI who declared themselves to be fascists. They also have a certain brand of kind of conspiracy theory, racism, the exclusivist idea of the national community drawn from that past, uh, but they also try and integrate it into a sort of wider uh, conservatism and basically the relationship with Berlusconi and also figures like Salvini has sort of helped them do that. Really, what they've succeeded in doing is breaking down any kind of boundary between uh, centre right and far right. So their ideas and their reference points 
uh, no longer seem um, extreme because they've been normalised as sort of part of the the general uh, sort of right wing uh, cultural uh, mass. So um, so yeah, I mean, I think of, you know, of course, uh, I mean, I I wrote an article for the New York Times, which then was very much perceived in Italy as you know, I had called Maloney a fascist, and then there was a lot of reaction against that. Uh, and Maloney herself, she was interviewed for La Stampa, which is a daily newspaper in Turin, and said, well, of course, we're not going to, you know, establish a dictatorship. But it's a quite strange thing to say, because, you know, of course, uh, you know, one would hope that would be the bare minimum. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we're not going to see, like, a fascist regime. I mean, that, that's mm-hmm. a kind of ludicrous idea of what could happen. W- what's much more likely is something more akin to the kind of things we see with, with governments like um, uh, Orbán's in... Viktor Orbán's in Hungary, uh, in which there's a certain kind of um, empowerment of the executive, very harsh attacks on opposition groups, uh, maybe even some sort of constitutional changes although it seems unlikely that Maloney will, will actually have a big enough majority uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. So, so I think it, it, it's part of a longer-term erosion of uh, certainly of anti-fascist sort of uh, standards, uh, but, but also of a, a certain kind of erosion of, 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 the, of, of a kind of more kind of participatory uh, idea of, of democracy. It's a rise of sort of identity politics and so on. But, but I don't think it's... it's it's not right to put it in the terms of like the overthrow of right. what went before because it's not like that. It's radicalization of a process that's been going on for a long time. So maybe let's wrap up on that question uh, because obviously, you know, I think people are wondering what comes next, right? So, uh, you know, you, you started answering a little bit of this, but what do you think Meloni and Brothers of Italy will actually be able to achieve in government? Uh, what are they going to try to do? Do you think that they have any sort of long-term staying power? And then finally, you know, what kinds of opposition or sort of institutional barriers or obstacles will they come up against? Well, I think that they... I mean, one thing that's important to to state as well is that they've they've made a very big deal in the big run up to this election of the fact of the well, of their intention to not uh, sort of upset Italy's place in the international order. So they made a very big deal of their commitment to NATO, of their support for Ukraine. They kind of distanced themselves from some of the previous kind of pro. Uh, Putin stuff, which had been very explicitly like you know, Putin is good because he defends Christian civilization, uh, and replaced that with a, a much more uh, hostile position. Uh, even to the extent that a lot of liberal media painted Salvini rather than Milani as the real kind of destabilizing force. Uh, also, in economic matters, I mean, they they promised some very severe. Um, tax cuts and indeed a flat tax rate to get rid of progressive income tax, uh, which would blow an enormous hole of in the public finances, you know, like a hundred billion euros a, a year. Uh, I think in practice, actually, they're not going to be able to do th- uh, that cu- that part of their agenda. Also, because the energy crisis is so severe that they'll actually have to pursue a more interventionist agenda than they'll even want to. Um, I I feel, in fact, that because the government is likely to be so mediocre uh, in its economic performance and also change a little in foreign policy terms, it will actually be tempted to make a bigger deal of sort of identitarian and sort of divisive um, policies, which are basically intended to harden a kind of right wing uh, base behind itself. Um, You know, there's a lot of churn in the uh, right wing electorate. Probably, probably more than half of Milani's voters voted for Salvini's Lega only three or four years ago. So I think in order to try and rally them behind her, um, it's very likely that she'll do things like you know we've we've uh, seen uh, proposed before uh, ideas like uh, a uh, a constitutional change which would um, uh, uh, criminalise apologism for communist totalitarianism and Islamic extremism. Uh, this, of course, the idea being that uh, that, you know, that kind of um, uh, law could be used to kind of squash various types of opposition. 
Uh, I think a, a big deal as well is that uh, you know she's promised a naval blockade of the Mediterranean uh, in order to um, stop migrants from crossing. Uh, I think, of course, the idea of literally blockading the whole Mediterranean is, is, is impossible, but certainly we can imagine things like clashes between the Navy and rescue boats, uh, sort of war with uh, NGOs, this kind of thing, uh, migrant rescue N- NGOs. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think, and of course, also we're, we're, one other thing is that, um, you know, this is uh, a government which is uh, hostile to things like the idea of allowing um, migrants uh, children born in Italy to um, get Italian citizenship, and which has even talked about uh, forcing businesses owned by non-EU nationals to like pay huge amounts of tax uh, up front, this kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, in that sense, it is much more likely that we'll see kind of lots of little wars around these kind of issues, uh, rather than a sort of a, you know, a sort of upsurge of of um, of of sort of authoritarianism in in that sense. I, th- I think it's um, also difficult to tell in a way how long it might last. Uh, the right wing parties together have a big parliamentary majority, uh, but there's a very strong tendency in uh, Italian politics for um, the coalitions to to kind of swap and switch even during the parliament. You know, the right-wing party stood for election together, but that doesn't mean they have to stay together. Um, and I think there are certain fault lines within the, the coalition, uh, particularly if, as we prob- probably ought to expect, uh, it will very soon head into a quite deep uh, recession. Uh, so I think, though I, uh, the caveat I put on that is, I don't think we can expect, oh, well, there's a big crisis, so therefore it's good because then she collapses because you know that could produce other kinds of negative consequences as well in terms of you know the the general direction of of politics has been for sort of solidaristic uh policies to and you know mobilization on the on the base of working class interests to become ever more absent and for various kind of right wing uh forms of reaction ideas of like you know tax cutting to create jobs and stuff even uh, to to become much more central to all political discourse. So I think uh, even if there is kind of deep stabilisation, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, what uh, eventually replaces her will be better. All right, uh, David Broder, again, we have to shout out his forthcoming book, Mussolini's Grandchildren, Fascism in Contemporary Italy. That is coming out from Pluto Press. And if you order the book from the Pluto Press website, you can get 20% off with the code BRODER20. David, great to see you as always. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thanks.